Well, good evening, everyone. Um, so, Professor Eunice um, has been described in a piece in Prospect magazine as a modest man with much to be modest about. His story began by suggesting that each of us should start with solving one person's problems, then doing the same for five people. Professor Eunice went a few better than that. Uh, since then, he's not just helped five people out of poverty, but millions of people out of poverty, with loans from the Grameen Bank. 90% of the poorest people in uh, Bangladesh now use Grameen services. He was awarded the Nobel P Peace Prize for his work on microcredit, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and the Congressional Gold Medal. He's one of only seven people to have done just that. They include Nelson Mandela and Mother Teresa, so oh. pretty good bedfellows. <laughs> Uh, somewhat closer to home, I can proudly say in the weekend FT we have a, something called lunch with the FT, where the idea is you sit down and have a nice informal lunch with a leading uh, figure in the world. Usually you have a nice sort of sandwich or a steak, and I can proudly say that Mah Mohammed Yunus is the first person ever to go to a lunch with the FT and only drink one glass of tap water. <laughs> I think that says something about the kind of style he has. Um, in the last few weeks, um, you've been invited to see both the Prime Minister of Egypt and the Prime Minister of India, of whom um, he hailed you as um, giving the poorest a life of hope, opportunity and dignity. I think we're privileged to have you here today in the Mermaid Theatre. And before we um, open the uh, talk, we're going to show you a short film about some of his work, and then we'll um, open to uh, inviting you on the stage. So, I think the film should start right now. This is a global event. It's a very significant event. It is addressing the fundamental question of agriculture. And this beginning is an auspicious beginning. It's a very important beginning because potato is not just another crop, it's a food. Campoyo is como una zona de trabajo que ha llegado para nosotros que nos va contra el tiempo a arreglar la vida y la situación que tenemos. Me, me gusta el programa por lo que veo que es una ayuda al, al campesino, nos, que el gobierno nos tenía como olvidados y entonces por este lado parece que, que sí nos, nos pueden ayudar. Campo Vivo empezó con ayuda del profesor Yunus como una iniciativa de McCain a nivel mundial para ir, yo le digo, más allá de la responsabilidad social corporativa crear una empresa que se va a dedicar a ayudar, en este caso, a gente en las áreas rurales a superar la condición de vulnerabilidad y de pobreza rural en la que se encuentran. Pues ese apoyo fue también fundamental porque nos dijeron, no, eh, hagamos el intento con esto, fumigamos así, fumigamos de tal forma, entonces pues yo creo que ahorita se están viendo los frutos de eso. El que la gente crea en personas que no conoce, en empresas que no han oído, o en equipos de trabajo que hasta ahora se están formando, es un reto bien interesante y eso ha sido de los mayores logros que hemos tenido con el negocio de Campo Vivo y el negocio con, con la comunidad. Les incentivo a todos que hagan este tipo de trabajo. ¿no? Este tipo, la, el equipo de Colombia han hecho un trabajo muy bonito acá, mucho trabajo, mucho laburo, años de planeación. No necesariamente tiene que hacer igual, pero el concepto de poder agregar más a la sociedad y no solamente mirar a nosotros, y poder dar y devolver un poco a la sociedad todo lo que tenemos, esto creo que también es nuestra misión. So what McCain is doing today is a sort of a revolution in in terms of agriculture, creating a social business themselves, not waiting for somebody else to create, and pr promising and committing themselves to bring the best technology to the growers of potato and to get the best price possible for the potato they produce. The focus here is on a very specific goal, alleviating poverty. It's not about making a profit. It's not about four or five different objectives. There's one objective. And with that, I'd like to invite Professor Yunus to begin your presentation. Thank you. I hope you don't mind if I stand up. You can leave right. me alone. <laughs> okay. I'll get you back. Good. Thank you. Well, I think I'll be more comfortable talking to you standing. 
and thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity to share my own experience and the work that I have been doing. And uh, <clears throat> I was reflecting on what is it that I have done. One thing stands out, I always did small things. I never tried to do any big thing. And, uh, and I, I never planned it. Uh, when I did the first time lending money, it's not because I planned to lend money. Everything happened with me in most cases, it's out of desperation. And particularly the case of uh, lending money to poor people was an act of desperation, not a pre-planned, calculated step. Because Bangladesh at that time, this is the mid-70s, Bangladesh just became independent after a terrible war, after a lot of devastation. And in, by 1974, we had a terrible famine in the country, people dying of hunger. Here I am, coming back from the United States where I was teaching economics, and now joined Bangladesh in a university to teach economics there. And here I'm very proud of what I teach. I <clears throat> feel good that I'm a teacher. I always wanted to be a teacher. That was my plan, that this is what I would be. And that's what I became. Then I see this famine in the country. Suddenly you realize that all those brilliant theories that you discuss in the classroom has no meaning in the life of the people. So you feel empty. There is no match between what you teach, what you see as a reality outside the door. And each, gradually you feel totally useless person. These things don't have any meaning to anybody. So I was wondering, what should I do? Whatever I have learned has no meaning to anybody. So it came to my mind, maybe I should just go out in the village next door because the university which I was teaching was in the middle of the villages. It's not urban centered campus. So I could just walk out of the campus, be in the village. I said, why don't I just go into the village, see if I can make myself useful to somebody at least as a person. So that was my big ambition, to make myself useful to another human being. And I, don't, I didn't know how. So I thought, I'll figure it out, seeing the problem, if I can be useful to, in some cases, even for one day. So that was the beginning of it. Then, among many things I did, I started discovering something in the village which took, looked terrible, loan sharking in the village. And how small amount of loans are given to a person, and in exchange you grab that person, totally ruin that person, by taking away everything in the pretext that you have taken a loan from me. And it's so ugly to see it at a close range. You read about it, but you read about it at a distance. Now you see it in a very close range, face to face. And I felt very helpless. I don't know what I can do about it. Again, it came to my mind suddenly, I can do something for these few people. I cannot solve the global problem of loan sharking, but here I can do something. Why don't I lend the money myself? And they don't have to go to the loan sharks anymore. So they will be free from the loan sharks. So I immediately acted on that. I started lending money from my own pocket. So that was on the spur of the moment decision, not a planned decision. I didn't know what will happen after that. Will they really be happy with this or it will not work out? But I did this anyway. It became very popular in the village. Everybody wanted to come and borrow from me. <laughs> it's so easy to get it. If you read about Grameen Bank, you'll always remember that uh, first loan that I gave was $27, given to 42 people. The total is $27. So you can imagine when you say small loan, how small that can be. And that's at the beginning. That's the money I was giving. That's the money they, which ruins their life by the loan sharks. 
so it became very popular. You know, very soon, my money was draining out, going out. And within two to three months, it's all done. It's everything is gone. <laughs> so, but people are lining up for more money. And the next village is coming up. They want money too. So then I thought, maybe I should go to the bank. They are the people who should be lending money. My job is not lending money. So if they want money, they should, bank should give it. So I went to the bank, and bank fell from the sky. Said, lending money to poor people? It doesn't happen. It doesn't work. I said, why not? So it became a big controversy. They will not open their door, and I'll not stop annoying them by insisting on it. But it didn't work. So I started looking at the people at the top of the banking sector to persuade them to open the door so that they can lend money to the poor people. I said, this is a very small amount of money. But nobody will listen to that. Finally, after about eight months, I gave them a counter proposal. I said, why don't you accept me as a guarantor? And I become the guarantor, you give the money. And if they don't pay back, I pay back. It's my responsibility. It's not easy to convince a banker. So they want to investigate everything, how much money I have, or how much money I can really countersign for. And finally, after about three months, they agreed to do that, accept me as a guarantor. I was very happy that now finally I found a way to open the door, the money can come. And I started doing that more elaborately, more systematically, and it worked. And later on, we created a bank after, with this and called it Grameen Bank or a village bank and repeating this whole thing. Two things keep asking me about uh, Grameen Bank. One is, uh, how did you do that? What is the best thing that happened to you? You could create a bank like this Grameen Bank. I said, well, I think the best thing that happened to me, I didn't know anything about banking. So I could do anything I want. Nobody is really kind of looking at me, with the, staring at me. You can't do that. So I could do anything because I didn't know anything. And I came up with the idea and it worked. So it was a good, good thing that I didn't go to school to learn about banking. Because I can create something which is completely different. Because it doesn't rely on collateral. So because if you are a banker, you'll be taught how collateral is so important to lend money and so on. So I did something which worked for people without any collateral, without any guarantee, without anybody's introduction, anything. Just a relationship you build up between the borrower and the lender. Basically, it's a trust-based relationship and you start lending money. Initially, it was not big money, but as you as the number keeps growing, it becomes bigger and bigger and bigger money. Today, we have eight and a half million borrowers in Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. We lend out over one and a half billion dollars each year, and each year it becomes bigger and bigger. But no collateral, no legal papers, nothing. But it works out. One of the best things people talk about microcredit in Grameen Bank is the repayment record. It's one of the top. It's very near 100%. People do it, not just few people, millions of people do it every week. One of the first principles that we adopted in our banking, people should not come to the bank. Bank should go to people. At that time when you are beginning it, it was easy because we are there in the village, we see people together. But as it grew, it became difficult because people don't have to come to the bank, we have to go to the people. Today, eight and a half million people spread out all over Bangladesh, 80,000 villages of Bangladesh. We work in every single village of Bangladesh. So what does it mean? Mean that none of them have to come to our office. We have to go to meet them at their doorstep to deliver the service. That's what the Grameen Bank is all about. And it's not easy. Bangladesh is a monsoon country, pouring rain doesn't matter. You have to go there to do your business. They are waiting. And everything that we do in Grameen Bank is in a weekly cycle. Within one week, we must meet all our borrowers and do the business at their doorstep. So 
our staff, which is about 25,000 people right now in the coming bank, they have to go and meet all these eight and a half million borrowers at their doorstep, rain or shine or hit, doesn't matter, flood, doesn't matter. This is their job. This is what they do. And that's how the Grameen Bank has been built up. Initially, the money was difficult. We are borrowing money from the central bank. Now that we became a bank, it's easy to get the money from the central bank and give it the money, loan, and so on. And gradually, one of the first things that we did, we encouraged everybody to save every week. Every borrower must have a bank account, must have a savings account, and they do. They save tiny little money, few pennies every week, whatever they get, they do that. But if large number of people keep saving every week, soon it becomes big number, big money. Today, after nearly 40 years, total money that borrowers have accumulated is huge money. I'll come back to that. Grameen Bank doesn't take money from the international sources or from the government or from anybody else. It generates money within the bank and lends the money to the poor people. That's what the Grameen Bank is all about. Depositors deposit the money and you take the money and lend it to the poor people. Today the whole thing has changed. Last year it's changed. I said we give out one and a half billion dollars now. Guess how much money the borrowers have saved in the bank. It's nearly two billion dollars. So when the staff of Grameen Bank in their discussion talk about the borrowers do this, borrowers are here, this is what they do. I said don't use it so lightly because they are not no longer borrowers. They are lenders. They are lending to you because they have more money to you kept than you give them. So you are the net borrower from them. So the table has turned. That is the power of microcredit. This is the power of people getting together and changing their life. And that's what became known as microcredit because there's no word in the English language to describe what we do. So we had to coin a word for that, called it microcredit. Later on, we used other word, mi mi microfinance and so on. But basically, this is what it does. While we are doing microcredit, there are many other, many other problems that we see among the poor people. And every time I see a problem, I try to address that somehow because it's just in front of you. You cannot walk away from that problem. One first problem that we see, the children of the family of the borrowers, the, these are all women. We focused on women, that's a long story, but we have 97% of our borrowers as women. So their children are very important to them. And I see them. One common problem that I see, they cannot see at night. After the sun goes down, they go blind. And I have no idea that such a thing existed as a disease. So I went to doctors, specialists to understand what is this happening in these families. Everywhere, not just one or two families. It's a very common thing. They told, well, it is called night blindness, exactly the way it is. At night you don't see, you're blind. If the children go blind. I asked, can this be cured? He said, yeah, it's a very simple thing, you can cure them. Uh, but they are not cured because nobody pays any attention. What is the cure? It's a vitamin A deficiency. If the children get some vitamin A, they will, their eyesight will be as good as anybody else. Where do you get vitamin A? Or give them some tablets, that will cure them. Or encourage them to eat vegetables. Vegetables have lots of vitamin A. And you identify which has lots of vitamin A and give them to eat. So I chose the vitamin A, not uh, tablet, but the vegetable option. So I encourage them to grow vegetable, feed the vegetable. But every time I see, they are not paying any attention to what I said. And I ask, what is the problem? The problem, we don't have the seed, we don't know how to do it. So I started with an idea, why don't I bring the seed to them? So I did it in a business way. I started a seed business alongside selling seed in a one penny packet, literally one penny. Each quantity of seed, one penny, is a small packet, and I gave it to them. And one penny people can afford, they will start buying it, throwing it around, and it grows, it's beautiful vegetables, they started enjoying it. As Grameen Bank grew, our seed business grew. 
at one point we became the largest seed seller in the country. Can you imagine? And in the process, night blindness disappeared in the country. So again, I tried to address it, not in a kind of bringing medical clinics or something. I thought it's such a simple idea. If it works, that's what the doctors are telling me. Why don't you do that? And I did that. So each one is like that. Every time I see a problem, I create a business to solve it. Sanitation was a big problem. People will go out anywhere. So it created a lot of problems, health problems, health hazards everywhere. So I made a rule in Grameen Bank. If you want to join Grameen Bank, First qualification requirement is you have to dig a hole and use it. In the beginning, everybody protested. Why you insist on that? I said, because this is spread diseases. So why should you be punished? I said, it's no punishment. You're protecting yourself. Just dig a hole. It doesn't cost you anything. Don't tell me that you're too poor to dig a hole. And we are so serious, nobody can get to Grameen Bank until they have dig a hole. So it became a customary. If somebody says, oh, I want to join Grameen Bank, how do I do it? And people will say, hey, first you dig a hole. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody knew that. So in the process, everybody started their own sanitation arrangement. And then we gave a sanitary loan to start a, set up a sanitary latrine. We sep created a separate business to produce sanitary latrine and sell sanitary latrine to every single Grameen Bank family because the bank gives the loan. So today, many years be before that, every single Grameen Bank family has sanitary latrine. And because sanitary latrine is a common thing among the poor people, it puts so much pressure on the middle class and the rich families in the villages, their women keep complaining. Even the beggar woman has a latrine in their home. How come we don't have it? Because they don't have it. As simple as that, that's a traditional way. So out of the pressure generated by women, now men started responding to it to create by the sanitary latrine which we produce right there to install sanitary latrine. So in sanitation, Bangladesh is far ahead of other countries around the neighborhood. So we did that as a business proposition. So we created a healthcare system. We created, we brought, uh, uh, health insurance program. Uh, each borrower can give uh, about $4 worth of money a year. And the entire family is covered under insurance just for $4 per year. And it worked out as a business proposition. We didn't want to lose money out of it. And we created all the health facilities in the village with doctors, with clinics, with the uh, lab and everything with $4 per person per family per year, this is it. So that again, we tried to address it in a healthcare way, uh, in a business way. And then we created hospitals, eye care hospitals, uh, social business way, in a business way so that it can cover. All these businesses that I created along the way has one element in it. It doesn't, it's not created to make money for anybody. It is created to solve problems. And I started calling them social business, business to solve problem non-dividend company to solve human problems. That's the whole idea of social business. And I started creating more and more of those social businesses. And it became interesting for other people, other countries. They became interested in it. And it became interesting for big companies. First big company that came to us to understand social business and want to do social business was Danone. It's a French company, yogurt company, milk product company. I have no idea about them but their chairman became very interested, Frank Ribot. He had a long session with me to understand social business. He said, I want to do social business. Tell me what I should do. In, in a conversation with their staff, they came to Bangladesh. I tried to understand what kind of social business they do. Finally, we decided on producing a special kind of yogurt with all the micronutrients which are missing in the malnourished children of Bangladesh. Bangladesh, Bangladesh, uh, the children of Bangladesh uh, are basically malnourished. Almost 48% of the Bangladeshi children are malnourished. Some of them severely malnourished. So we wanted to address that. There are many attempts, many programs, but still they are malnourished. It didn't reach them. So we, we thought we'll address it in a business way. And Danone came and joined with us. We created that. We made it a very simple yogurt with uh, micronutrients in it. 
and then sell it, very, make it very cheap and make it very delicious. Children love it. So they started enjoying it. And now those is becoming popular yogurt for children. And gradually their health situation completely changes because they get the micronutrients which are missing in the, pro, in the program. Uh, how did Danone get to it? How did Danone find the money to do that? That's a very interesting story, I'll tell you, because uh, it kind of clarifies many of the ideas about social business. The whole project was, uh, the project cost was one million dollar. And half of it will be given from the, our side, from the Grameen side, and half a million will be given by, invested by uh, Danone side. We gave our money quickly, promptly, but Danone money doesn't come. We wait for weeks, we wait for months, they don't send the money. So we send them emails, send, remind them, they say, wait, we're getting back to it, but they don't get back to it. Finally, I talked to them, what is the problem? They said, well, we are facing some problem releasing this half a million dollar that we need to do because our lawyers are objecting to it. What is the objection of the lawyer? The objection of the lawyer is shareholders of Danone gave the management all this money to make more money. Now management wants to invest this money, shareholders money, into a company in Bangladesh which says upfront they will never give any dividend. So this will be violation of the mandate that the shareholders gave to the management. So you cannot do that. So we got stuck. I said, that, does it mean that we abandon this project? No, no, no. We are very much with it. We'll have to find a way to find this money. So they found a way. Two or three months later, they had the annual general meeting. Before the annual general meeting took place, they circulated a letter to all the shareholders, which is about 300,000 plus shareholders with a common message. Message is, Danone has done very well this year. We are successful this way, successful that way. And we are giving you a dividend X amount of money. Then at the end is one paragraph. They say, we want to invest half a million, year, uh, half a million dollar in Bangladesh for this particular project. Uh, if you are interested to invest in this, sign up at the bottom, at the box, click, put the tick mark in your uh, box and say what percentage of your dividend you would like to invest in this. And then we'll deduct it from your dividend and put it there. 98% of the shareholders signed up. They have been repeatedly warned, remember this money will never give you any dividend. This money will be used to do this, this, this. That's it, that's the purpose. So 98% is exciting news that they, they wanted to invest in this. So what the lawyers were protesting now has been done by going directly to the shareholders to get their opinion and get their money, own money, into that. In the process, they got $35 million. <laughs> they were looking for half a million dollars. And they created a new problem. And they were really upset about the problem. A problem was their employees got very upset. They kept complaining, writing letters, calling up the management. Do you consider us as a second class citizen? You asked the shareholders to participate in this project. But you never asked us. You think we are too poor or too to be indifferent, to be interested in that. So the management was kind of encouraged to write another letter to all the employees telling the same thing, how much you want to invest. In the process, they got $30 million. So they got $65 million in total for half a million they needed. And they created a whole fund out of it, a social business fund. Today, they have 14 different social business projects in eight different countries with that money. And many more money is coming. Today, the balance of money they have in that fund is $91 million in the fund waiting for investment in social business. So that to say that people are not interested in social business, this is a, just a concrete demonstration how people want to do things which they like to do. So we created a lot of these programs and now it's spreading in other countries. Uh, we have created a company called uh, uh, Unus Social Business. It's based uh, headquarters in uh, Frankfurt. So through that, 
company. We do it in uh, several countries, in Brazil, in Colombia, in Haiti. One you saw is in Colombia. This is, again, another joint venture that you saw with McCain to bring in potato cultivation in, uh, in uh, Colombia. Uh, again, there's a story behind it. Uh, Colombia lost all its coffee market. You don't see any Colombian coffee anymore. Colombian coffee was the king of coffee, but not anymore. It's disappeared from that. Because Asian coffee growers have taken out the market, the best quality and cut pr best price possible. So Colombian coffee growers have no business, nothing to do. So all the investors who came for the coffee growing in Colombia, they left Colombia with their money. The people who grew co coffee have no, nothing to do, no income, nothing. So they are appealing to us, can you help us to involve these poor people in some way? <coughs> then this thing worked. McCain became interested in the idea of social business. They discuss, started discussing with us. And then we gave the idea, why don't we do a Mac joint venture in uh, Colombia? To do what? To grow potato. So the coffee growers are now growing potato. That's what you saw. Uh, and they used to be workers, farm workers. Now we are turning the farm workers into farmers because they started having their own land. We purchased the land, we leased them land to them and growing potato and sharing this potato with the company and getting the best price. Last year was the best. First season, the first season they have grown 52 tons per hectare, per hectare which is a national average for potato in Colombia is 22 tons per hectare. So it's more than double that they have grown the yield that they produce. So this is now expanding. So these are the social businesses. And then we got another problem I briefly mentioned and I'll conclude. The problem of the young people in the Grameen Bank borrowers' families. Because we wanted to make sure the borrowers' children had a good edu education. Uh, because their parents are all illiterate. So we make sure that all the children go to school, we give them education loan, and so on and so forth. But what happened ultimately, they finish their education, but there's no job. So they kept complaining, what, what is the use of going to school? There's nothing for us. We'll never get any job. Then I started telling them, who told you that you have to have a job in the first place? Is it something written in your book that you have to have a job? Is it something your teacher told you you have a job? I said, always remember that this old job, getting job is old fashioned idea. Forget about that. You are a young generation of new, new world. So you should be thinking in a different way. And you tell it to yourself all the time. Repeat to yourself, I'm not a job seeker. I'm a job creator. I'm a job giver. And behave like a job creator. Act like a job creator. Don't feel like a job seeker. It's a completely different psychology altogether. So be a job creator. They didn't understand how do you do that. So what we did, we created a social business fund and now encourage all the young people to come up with business ideas. Once you have a business idea that can fly, we invest. We give all the money you need and we become your partner, help you to become a successful entrepreneur and we continue. We tell them, look, your mother became an entrepreneur, but she was an illiterate person. If your illiterate person can become an entrepreneur, take care of the family, take care of you, what good is your education? If you're just saying that I have no job, your mother didn't wait for a job, she went ahead and did it. Why didn't you go ahead and do it? So now they are doing that. We are, we are putting the money, we become the, we give the, all the investment they need and turn this. So I said, unemployment is totally an uh, artificial creation of human mind. It doesn't belong to human being. Human beings are born as an entrepreneur. Human beings all throughout history are go-getters. But you put go-getters into become workers to take orders for somebody else and live your life in a very limited way. I said that's the wrong direction our economic thinking has put us into. And we have to f get away from that. And that's the d direction that we are trying to create. Now we see youth unemployment in Europe. I try to remind them that so you are going in the wrong direction, trying to create jobs for them. You'll never have enough job for everybody. But that's a, because th to begin with is the wrong direction. It, we will be teaching, encouraging young people in school at every stage how to be 
themselves, how to be creative, how to be entrepreneurs, successful entrepreneurs, and that is the direction we'll go. Job will be a second or a third choice, or and it will do it. Uh, it should not be any human being's first choice. First choice should be use your creative power, entrepreneurial power, and to make it happen. So along that, we can redesign the whole system. And if you redesign the whole system, there is no reason anybody who should be a poor person in the world. And if you redesign the system, there's no reason why anybody should be unemployed. And you can go down the line and you create a completely new way of doing and new of living. And thank you very much. Well, I think, I think as you can tell, um, uh, Professor Yunus is a man not with micro ambitions, but macro ambitions. Um, I wanted to start with the idea of entrepreneurship. And we spoke yesterday, and you said to me something which I, I scribbled down. And you said, even if I have to starve, I will not work for anyone. Yeah. I think that's a pretty striking statement um, yeah. of your mentality. And that interesting how many people are clapping about <laughs> that. So I wonder if you can just start from that in terms of as a sort of... Yeah. I was telling people that if I open a school, if I open a university, I'll make it a condition that if you enter this university, one of the commitments that you'll never ask for a job. You'll create jobs. And only then you'll be admitted to this university and we'll help you to be yourself, be a creator, be, and be an entrepreneur, what your natural self is all about. And I said, uh, some of them will say uh, that not only I will not ask for a job, uh, I would rather starve than ask for a job. And that's my commitment. That's the kind of thing people should do. Because we, are, we have our twisted our mindset in such a wrong way that now we are waiting for job to come or we are running around to find a job because uh, the society points finger at you if you don't have a job, as if it's your failure. And I'm saying it's not your failure. It's the failure of the system, the way we thought. Because... To begin, it was wrong thinking to make you a worker, to work for somebody, whereas you should be doing it in your own way. You should be using your own creative power. Uh, so now, instead of punishing, punishing the system, people are punishing you. The system is punishing you. I said, this is the wrong way. We should be punishing the system and get rid of the system which created misery for not only a few thousand or a few million people. See, when I talk about unemployment, I'm not looking at the unemployed young people in, in Europe. If you look at it globally, it's not only millions, it runs into billions. And that's the kind of society we have created just for the flaws that we have made inside of the thinking, what we call economics. But don't you think it's romanticizing what people can actually do to tell them that everyone can get a job and everyone can be an entrepreneur? A lot of us may be useless entrepreneurs I mean, I know I'd be a useless entrepreneur. Uh, that's what you think, because that's what you're taught. Yep. But really, you are an entrepreneur. Uh, I am encouraged. I'm not d giving it as a kind of a fairy tale stories. When I ask you, poor women, take money from Grameen Bank. I, I'm here to give, you, give this money. What is the message I give her? That you take this money, you start your business. And that's what she does. She's not take this money and find somebody else to get a job. That's not the route that microfinance gives her. So it's not one young, uh, not one woman, not two, not hundred, not thousands. It's millions. Today, right in within Grameen Bank, there's eight and a half million women, which are entrepreneurs, maybe tiny entrepreneurs. Maybe they started their life with $30, $40, $50 as an entrepreneurial activity. Now, today, probably after 40 years, she may have $1,000, $2,000, $5,000. That's the size of her business, but nonetheless, she's an entrepreneur. And it's not limited to Grameen Bank. All over Bangladesh, there will be more than 60 million women who has microcredit in their hand and entrepreneurs. So if they say, oh, I'm not an entrepreneur, you give me a job, I'll be made, I'll clean your floor. That's how I know the whole microcredit collapse. It doesn't have any meaning. So, and globally, probably there are 160 million women with microcredit. They are all entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Now we are telling the young person that he can't be as good as his mother. I can't believe that. Or anybody else cannot be as entrepreneurial as they have done. I can't believe that. 
So I have concrete proof. I, I'm in, interested in some of the proof. Obviously, there are a lot of people who've been looking at the whole microcredit phenomena. Banks have been getting into it. People like Wonga have got into microcredit or at least different kinds of credit. And obviously, that's led to some doubts about some of the incentives of why people are going into it. And I'd be interested in your analysis about uh, some of the critics of microfinance and people like Esther Duflo, who uh, says it's not always the miracle some people claim. Well, it, it's a question of what you define as a miracle. Somebody is a normal, somebody is a miracle. Uh, one, you see, I have to confront these arguments again and again. Uh, people say, well, you give tiny little money, all those development experts, and you give tiny little money to a woman, that's not development. I said, would you please explain to me what is development? I said, to me, if a family which lives in one meal a day, if they somehow manage the second meal, second meal a day, that's a development miracle that move from one meal family to two meal family. I have met many families in Grameen Bank, or the joining Grameen Bank, could have only one piece of clothing they could wear. If they wash that cloth, they cannot get out of home, out of their house, because they don't have a second piece of clothing. It's a shame for, for her to come out with this, such a situation. So I said, if a one-piece clothing family goes into two-piece fam clothing family, that's a development miracle for me. If you replace your leaky roof in monsoon country to a solid roof, that's a development miracle for me. Someone who never had a toilet in her life, in their family life, ever, in any generation, have first time having a toilet, that is the development miracle for me. So it's a question of what you say miracle. And I gave you the example. These are concrete examples. When I say they have $2 billion in their savings account, this is not a talk. Just to you. These are facts, the banking information. So someone who never could save only a few pennies a week now has a huge banking bank account, that's a development miracle for her. In the process, not only she has the saving, not only she has the loan, in the process she is a businesswoman. So her status in the family changed completely. So this is not a fairy tale. And the Grameen Bank is owned by the borrowers, not by rich people or somebody else. They run the bank, they sit in the board, they make decisions. And that's a Grameen Bank, that's microcredit. And what do you feel about the fact that lots of commercial enterprises have been getting into the same space and trying to make money from the poor? Yeah. Uh, I always try to bring out the fact that we started microcredit with no, with no intention of personally making money for ourselves. That's the story I was telling, narrating how I give the money from my pocket and so on. Not with the intention of I'll make a lot of money by doing that. Loan sharks are already doing that, making a lot of money out of that. We are trying to fight the loan sharks so that loan sharks can get eliminated. And we, have bring, we bring microcredit in a way, in a sustainable way. And then when we created Grameen Bank, we didn't want to own this bank. If I wanted, I could own the bank, but that's not how I created it. I made them the owners of the bank, the borrowers. So they own the bank. So we, if we had intention of making money, we would have done a completely different way. So I said, we, we always thought today, after all this uh, experience that we have gone through, we would call it a social business. That's how we've intended, that's a, to solve a problem that we created for them. Uh, so those who are trying to make money out of microcredit, uh, those who are using microcredit to make money for themselves, I think they're in the wrong direction completely. So we are on the wrong side. That's not microcredit. The word, I have even appealed to them many times, please don't use the word microcredit. Use some other word so they don't confuse the people. What is social business and what is money-making business? I said, if you use the word mic uh, microcredit, then all the payday lenders, they say, we are microcredit too. They charge 1,000% interest, 2,000% interest. It's a flourishing business in the United States. I don't know how flourishing business it is in here, but in the United States situation, it's a flourishing business. The payday lenders, and with 5,000, 4,000% interest rate. So if you call them microcredit, then what can we do? It's a wrong, it's a total abuse of the word. So they should clear off your patch. That's right. We tell yeah. them that there's a okay. right microcredit and there's a wrong microcredit. So probably they, those who want to make money, maximize profit for them, they will be the wrong microcredit.
I want to talk a bit about inspiration for you. I mean, obviously, a lot of people see you as an inspirational figure. Who have you seen as an inspirational figure? Well, I'm sure many people. Uh, probably in the early stage, uh, when I was growing up, I would say my mother was my inspiration because she, she didn't go to school to study very much. She was a fourth grade, fifth grade probably. That's all about education she had. But a very unique character, very open, very uh, helping pe person. So she, she always inspired me on that, whatever she did. The other one, the inspiration I get from the people that I work with, all these women that work in the village, they, how hard their life is and how they work so hard to make a little difference in their life, to make sure their children don't have to go through the misery that she has gone through. That's the only thing she does. And she's so committed, given this tiny money she gets in her hand, she tries to get the best mileage out of this money. When she received this first money, when you give her loan from Grameen Bank, as I said, the initial loan would be about $30 or $35. When she holds this money, she literally shakes. She cannot stand still because she cannot believe anybody could trust her with such an enormous amount of money. She thinks this is such a huge money. She doesn't know what, how to handle that money. So that's where the shaking part comes. And she, inside of her, she keeps promising. Anybody who has trusted her all this money didn't ask for anything, just gave her the money on the basis of the trust. She will give her life to make sure that trust is kept. And her eyes, the eyes will be, tears will be running down from her eyes not believing that it's real. It's, it's not a dream, it's a real thing. And the rest of her life, she struggles to make sure she makes that thing true, that yes, she, her trust will never be broken. And that's what keeps the whole Grameen Bank microcredit together, the relationship of trust between the two. But how do you feel in your unique position? You travel all around the world, uh, meeting a lot of the sort of Davos elite bankers and uh, entrepreneurs and billionaires. How do you sort of manage that relationship between, you know, the woman who holds this money in her hand and respects the value of it and people who often, you know, who have far too much of it? Well, as, as you mentioned about the inspiration, I get so inspired, I want to share with everybody else because otherwise they will never know what and this is all about. And move some of their money from one pot to some of these women, maybe. Uh, could be, but that's not the message that I give because I keep repeating that Grameen Bank doesn't take any money from anybody. And I thought this is a, something to be emphasized. Poor people not waiting for money from somebody else. It's their money. And today, as I said, this whole table is turned. It's more of their money in the bank than the bank gives them the money. So it's a, money is not something that has to come from outside. The now, in, te in terms of microcredit, we talk about giving money to help people, poor people. It comes, again, not because of the poor people. It's because something wrong in the system. Because you're not allowing banking to be done with the poor people. Your bank, the bank, banking law doesn't allow that. Banking law is so rigid and so on. So if you create a new banking law to create bank for the poor, nobody has to give any money from outside. All you have to do, uh, maybe open an account in a uh, poor people's bank. You put your deposits as you do with any other, get the same service. So it's a more of a commercial relationship yes. rather than a charity relationship. But do you get frustrated by the levels of inequality that you obviously... Very much. It's a, again, it's a, it's a flaw in the system. As I keep repeating that, first of all, uh, the machine, what we call economic uh, machine, which works, is basically is a sucking machine. It keeps sucking from the bottom and transports into the top. So top becomes very juicy, very fat, very big. And the bottom becomes very dry. It's not the fault of the people who are running this machine. It's fault of design, the people who design the machine. These are good people, but they have no option. This is what you can do. But if you were running the world, what kind of machine would you design? I'll turn it around, like I did the microcredit in the banking system. So the I mean, bank we did is a kind of reversal of the conventional banking system. So I'll reverse it. Like uh, uh, several things I mentioned about reversal, like what should the people do? I said, now the, the interpretation of the current capitalist system is that you have to be workers. Only few people will be entrepreneurs, lucky ones, 
and they will be hiring you. If they don't hire you, your life is gone, finished. So you are at the mercy of those people who will be hiring. I said, that's a wrong, wrong story completely. Everybody's an entrepreneur. But we have not built a system to support the entrepreneurs of everybody being entrepreneur. If you create the ecosystem so that everybody can really become an entre entrepreneur and create enterprise, so those distances between the income level will not be there. When you hear that 85 people in the whole world, just 85 people, have more wealth together than the bottom half of the entire population of the planet, what kind of message you're getting? What kind of machine that we have in our disposal? And it will get worse. It will not get better. So the, if, you, if you look at this, how, how little the people at the bottom get, you say, well, they don't work. They, don't. they work. They work harder than anybody else. Simply that work doesn't translate into return that they should be expecting. So that's the system fault. Does this make you angry? Uh, not angry in the sense I want to throw bottles at you or something like that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> that's what I was looking at. <laughs> Very handy. Uh, yes, I'm upset that uh, we are not paying attention to it. That uh, this is the reality of life. The reality is, uh, the, and this can be changed. And I give the example, uh, one that we have gone through, like in Bangladesh, for example, of the Millennium Development Goals. Number one goal is to reduce poverty by half. And Bangladesh has done that. Uh, before 2015. We are supposed to achieve this by the end of 2015. Bangladesh has achieved it by the middle of 2013. So two and a half years before the target date. So this they have accomplished that and reduced large number of people move from the poverty to non-poverty and shifted that. And we, the, that population poverty, uh, under poverty line has declined. We, so it can be done. Uh, it's not something, again, a fairy tale that all people should go out of poverty. And we are saying that by 2030, everybody in Bangladesh should be out of poverty. Not a single person should be a poor person. And what I say about Bangladesh is also true for the whole world. We can create a world where no single person will be a poor person because poverty doesn't belong to individual human being. It's a, it's a system which imposes on you. It's this Im externally imposed condition what we call poverty. But do you think after the financial crisis, we've much, become much more aware of some of the problems in, inherent in the financial uh, structures? So in fact, even today, Janet Yellen, governor of the US Fed, denounced Wall Street banks and their culture, saying there may be pervasive shortcomings in the values of large financial firms that might undermine their safety and soundness. And she basically accused them of bankers of flouting the law brazenly. I think we all know some of those bankers' names. Um, but I'd be interested in your take on how far the differences between the sort of Grameen Bank culture, where you 98% you know, people pay back their, their loans, and the sort of structure of financial services in which we've seen evident in the financial crisis. In 2008, uh, we are invited by s s some Americans to start a Grameen program in the USA because they said we tried many ways to introduce microcredit in USA, it never worked. So I, they said we have tried it in 500 different organizations who tried to do microcredit in USA and all of them failed. And I keep telling them you can do it 5,000 times, you fail, but still I'll say you didn't know how to do it, it's your failure, not the microcredit failure. So they get so uh, kind of upset about that. They said, why didn't you come and do it for ourselves and, and show us how to do that? I said, I'll do that. So we started in January of 2008 in Jackson Heights in Queens, one branch of Grameen Bank. And we are doing it and we're doing very well. We're very excited. It's exactly working like we did in Bangladesh. We brought people from Bangladesh to run this program. And then later half of 2008, all the crisis came and banks are collapsing all around us in New York City. And I was there at that time. I said, I wish some journalists will come and interview me right now. And the question is, tell me who is credit worthy? Because this was an issue right from the beginning. Poor are not credit worthy. It's useless to give them money. So I said, now is a good time to ask because it's a, we are running microcredit program with 100% repayment right there. And on the other side of the road, huge big 
bank is collapsing. It's melting away because their creditors are not paying back the money. So now you define who is a creditworthy person. Is the poor person? Is the creditworthy person? Or the rich guy who took a lot of money and is not going to pay you back is the creditworthy person. So that's the question. And I said, I'm very happy that this crisis has taken place. We should be taking advantage of it. This is a crisis, but crisis opens up the door for opportunities. And this is an opportunity to redesign the entire banking system. So please don't go back to the old system of banking. This is a good occasion to redesign, re rebuild piece by piece another banking system, which will be inclusive banking system. Nobody will be excluded from the banking system. Even the homeless person can walk into a bank and deal with the bank. And that's the kind of banking system we want to create. But people were so hurry, in a so hurry. Every government was such a hurry to go back. They will not consider changing anything. They would rather give a big bailout package and say, please go in will give you taxpayers' money to go in. And they paid a lot of money. You are too big to fail. So we go back to all those logic and so on. We go back to again, saying, that, well, we have not done anything. So we missed the opportunity. And I was, keep, I was telling, and I'll repeat it now, by going back to the same track, it's not an escape. You're not saying that, ah, oh, we have overcome. You have not overcome. You're simply waiting for a bigger crisis next year or year later on. The hole is there. You have not filled up the hole. You are simply going back to the same track in the same direction. You have to lay down a new track in the new direction. Then you will be overcoming the crisis. So it's a, it's a waiting for the next crisis. That's all. It's a bit ominous. Um, I just want to come a bit more to your personal life. And I mean, you live a fairly extraordinary life. And it would be just great to sort of share the kind of, I mean, you basically travel all the time. Uh, you're opening up social businesses all around the world. You meet lots of world leaders from the Prime Minister of Egypt recently yeah. and the Prime Minister of India. And I just want to get a sense of your life on an aeroplane <laughs> and uh, what that's like being you, basically. Well, uh, I got used to it. <laughs> I had to travel because uh, I felt excited when somebody's starting a social business and want to hear about it. We hold an uh, annual convention of micro uh, sorry, social business people bring all the practitioners, all the big companies who are interested and already involved in social business uh, together and discuss future plans, future programs, and many who would like to examine the concept and they want to come and raise questions in the forum. We call it Social Business Summit. So uh, every year there's a Social Business Summit. So this is one I have to go. Uh, and then uh, last year we had it in Mexico City. This year we'll have it in Berlin in November, always in November. Okay, but on the journey there, do yeah. you watch romantic movies on the plane? <laughs> yes, I do. Great. <laughs> that's, that's the only so, occasion I watch movies. Otherwise, okay. I don't get the time. So when you, there are times when you're not saving the world, Ben. So we can all feel <laughs> a little bit relieved. <laughs> well, I try to learn what's going on in the movie sector. See. Obviously, obviously. <laughs> but I was see, if... I, you see, one issue that I always raise, and when I see movies, I, it keeps coming back to me. I said, Sci scientific world changed because of the science fiction. You bring imagination. Science fiction is nothing but imagination. You are imagining things about the world, about the planets, and the troubles, and so on and so forth. And you get absorbed in it. And you create devices which you never heard about. This transporter, you stand there, and suddenly you disappear. You end up in someplace else. And this is something they show you. And, and many of the things we are using today, 10 years back, this will be science fiction things. And now we are real thing. So science or the technology followed science fiction. And that's why the science moves on, technology moves on. It always gives you. Imagination is what drives people. So imagination is very, very important. And science fiction brings that imagination and bolder and bolder imagination and technology follows that path. I said, I wish somebody has been writing social fictions. Fictions about how human beings would be on this planet, this strange world, where they say, you know what? There's some news I saw in the internet. What did you say? There's one guy got unemployed. What is unemployed? Is he sick? No, he's not sick. But why is he unemployed? Cannot he doesn't work? He doesn't function? No, he can function. Then why is he unemployed? People so will be see, puzzled. Your next job is then as a Hollywood script writer. Absolutely, Clearly. yes. This is <laughs> yeah, another, that would I yeah, enjoy very much indeed. Yeah. Uh, another thing we were talking about a bit about is actually selfies. 
you know, the life of being a globetrotting uh, Nobel laureate and how many people want to have their picture taken with you and how you deal with that sort of attention. Well, I enjoy it. People want to take pictures, why not? <laughs> They do the selfies and all kinds of things. But you said something about how people queuing up when you actually go to the bathroom. <laughs> well, th because they can't catch me elsewhere, so they, this, is a, this is a safe place to get me. <laughs> um, I have lots of questions, but I'd like to open up to the room for a, for a few minutes and then come back to a few questions sure. as well. Um, we have uh, probably about 10, 15 minutes for questions, and then I'll finish up with some questions. R right in the middle. Uh, with the shirt sleeves rolled up or down. Uh, Hello. Thank you for the seminar. Um, I have a quick question. The introduction of social business has become a bit of a trend. Uh, even in smaller communities now, there's a concept that every local business has to contribute to the society or community that is based in. Um, there's a strong desire to capitalize on that by bigger corporations under the umbrella of corporate social responsibility. What are your thoughts of that? And do you feel it's a genuine notion of attempt of social business or is it a half-hearted attempt? Yeah, uh, that's good that uh, it's becoming known to the corporate bodies and so on. I mentioned about the joint ventures. This is very important. For Danone, which is a huge global organization, social business they run in Bangladesh is a tiny little uh, enterprise. As I said, it's a $1 million worth of investment. Now today it's a grown bigger than that. Uh, but that $1 million investment there tells something, that they have the technology, they have the power to address a very important problem of the world. If they delink themselves from the profit motive, suddenly this yogurt is born. If Danone, Danone is probably a 62-year-old company right now, if they continue for another 62 years, they will not have invented this uh, yogurt if they didn't get into the social business uh, format. And then they started looking at things that they can do. Today, they have water programs as a social business to bring water to people. So this is important, but to give a CSR. CSR is still a kind of a charity window. It's not a social business window. And we're saying that, why don't you use it as social business investment? Charity is a wonderful thing. It does a lot of good things, but the one limitation of charity is money goes out, does a good work, but it doesn't come back. So you have only one time use of the money. But if you can create a social business, the same thing, then you use this money in a social business and it does the same work done and the money comes back. So you have endless use of the same money over and over and over again. So it becomes very powerful. So this is what we're trying to explain to businesses who are dealing with the CSR. Again, CSR is used, uh, is deviated from its original intention of helping societies and so on. In many cases, I'm not saying everybody's doing that. In many cases, CSR money used to build up images for the company rather than doing good things for the people. So that's again, uh, in the, using it in the wrong direction. And I'm, I'm appealing to all the companies when they hear about it, become interested in Why don't you start a small social business of your own? You have a mega business running, but take a tiny little money of your own investment and put into social business to solve one of the problems that you have around yourself. Take five welfare people out of welfare. That's your social business, in a business way, not in a charity way. Okay, I give him a job. That doesn't solve a problem. Create a business around them so that they enjoy their benefits they get from the, uh, the salary they get from the business and the business is self-sustaining and it grows and you get your money back from the business because of the profit it earns. But after that, you don't want to take any profit out with it. So it's plowed back into the business. Then you can hire another person, sixth person and the seventh person. So you created a social business. But in the process, you created a miracle seed. That seed will solve the problem of welfare all over the world because you found a way how to get the welfare people out of the welfare. Instead of dependence, they become self-reliant with the respectable people themselves started respecting their own worth. And that's what it should be. And that's what we can do. But nobody pays any attention to it. It's only five people. That if you do it five people, we can do five million people by repetition. And that's what the microcredit does because that's where our experience comes. When we did few people in one village, 
And all the rest of life I have done, repeat that thing, what we did in the first village. And it became nationwide, now it became worldwide. It's a repetition of the same thing, what you have experienced. Same way unemployed people that I was just mentioning, to take these unemployed people and convert them into entrepreneurs. Just try with five people. We are doing it to a large number of young people in Bangladesh. I'm saying anybody can try it with five people. It's not, it doesn't he, ask for a huge investment of that any kind. So these are the messages that I try to bring and tell the young people, don't wait for jobs. Just go ahead, do it yourself, your business and so on. Start thinking about it. And if you want, if you're interested in social business, just design a social business. You don't have to go and do it yourself. If you can design a social business, Put it in your Facebook, put it in your website. Somebody says, this is a great idea, I would like to invest in it. And now we are creating all those people who would like to invest in that social business. So that's the direction we want to go. I'd like to open up for a, a few more questions and I'll take a few at a time and then we can... Um, um, so I'm going to bias, I'm going to go for um, front row and then one at the back at the, uh, the chap at the back. Yep, waving the hand. And so we'll start with you and then come down to the front and then um, we'll take the two questions. Yeah, hi. Uh, is this on? Yeah, yep. there we go. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you very much. That was Thanks. very inspiring. Uh, I just have one question about a new kind of capitalism would surely have to deal with um, the bleak subtext that goes with every, or like all of, all of what you've been speaking about, which is the environment. Um, and I was wondering what could be done about the impending environmental crisis? Like, I'd, I don't want to be an, an environmental um, sort of killjoy on this, but yeah. it seems like a very important issue in relation to social right. business, right. reproduction yeah. of capitalism, right. reproduction of social right. relations. Um, and in the front. Yes, that was inspiring. Um, I have a question about a different social term, which is social capital. Do you have evidence that the social capital, the connection, the confidence of your customers has developed and grown. And with that is, you seem to be implying that there's a problem with education, that education leads to a peculiar lack of aspiration. I just wondered if you could comment a bit about education and social capital. Okay. Uh, going back to the environment issue, I, I try to sum up what I'm trying to do uh, in terms of three zeros, that's what I call three zeros. Zero poverty, because poverty doesn't belong to human society. It's again artificially created for people. It doesn't belong to individuals who are poor. So we can create that world where nobody will be a poor person. Zero unemployment. Nobody will be unemployed. There's no reason why anybody should be un unemployed. They're all capable people, creative people just release the spell that economic theory put on them. So now suddenly they became paralyzed, they cannot function. So it's something coming externally on them. So remove that spell, be a human being, do things that you want to do. Zero unemployment and zero net carbon emission. And we can create that zero net carbon emission. And we have no other option but to do that. Uh, through social business, we try to do those uh, uh, achieving those. Uh, two examples on the unemployment side and the poverty side I mentioned on the uh, side of uh, zero emission. Uh, we have created some of those uh, green businesses like we create renewable energy company in Bangladesh as a social business to bring solar energy. Bangladesh doesn't have uh, much of electricity. 70% of the people of Bangladesh don't have electricity. So virtually is it still the same cave age story. Darkness comes, you have a little kerosene lamp. So I thought maybe we should bring the renewable energy to replace it. At that time, everybody thought it's a crazy idea. Renewable energy is good for Europe, but for Bangladesh, it's too expensive to do that. I said, no, it's not expensive. It can be done for anybody. So we created the company and gradually we introduced it, convinced people to buy it. And today we have one and a half million homes with solar energy, and it continues. We sell more than 1,000 solar home systems per day, and it's a big company now in the country. Many other such NGOs and other companies coming to sell solar home systems because it's very popular, because it makes sense. 
kerosene price and the solar energy price competes with each other very comfortably, it's no problem. So that's one, just to give one example how we can bring renewable energy before the fossil fuel energy gets in to replace that and so on. Uh, at the same time, we are now with one of the big projects of social business in Haiti to reforest Haiti because Haiti became totally deforested. Reason is people chop up the tree to make charcoal to do the cooking. So in the process, Haiti lost all its forest. Only 2% of the forest left. So when we got involved with the social business in Haiti, one of the first business we created is to reforest Haiti. We call it Haiti Forest. Our challenge, our mission is to reforest entire Haiti. And we started the process. And forestry is a very attractive social business because it generates income continuously. So as, you, as it generates income, you continue to plow it back and continue to build it up uh, acre by acre, hectare by hectare, you continue. And that's our thing, and it's a going project. So we got the participation from uh, Virgin Unite. They are the partners, and Clinton Global, uh, uh, sorry, Clinton Foundation is a partner. Many other partners have joined in to make it happen. So we want to do it in a business way, in a social business way, not to make money out of the forest, but making sure that, that the forest is there, it covers its own cost, and continually function, continually expand and maintain itself. So these are two examples. There are many other examples. You, when you bring the whole idea of business, sustainable way, without any intention of making money, this is what you can achieve. Suddenly your mind starts working in a completely different area, which you never worked before, because it is always looking for the profit side. I'm not against profit. I always explain by saying human beings are both selfish and selfless at the same time. So you have to have the selfish business. It's fine. But all I'm saying, you also can have the selfless business, which is the social business. In selfish business, everything is for me, nothing for others. In selfless business, everything for others, nothing for me. And that's it. And people say, why should people go into social business? There is no return to it. I said, it depends what is the return you mean. I say, if you make the profit is the only return, profit is the only incentive in your life, you are wrong. There are many other incentives, but you simply didn't discover it. I said, making money is a happiness. Making other people happy is a super happiness. So it's all a question of deciding which way you want to go and make a mixture of it. You do the one, make yourself happy with money, and also make yourself super happy with dealing with the other people's problems and solve it. Because you, as a creative person, that is the signature you'll put behind when you leave this world, that I did this during my lifetime. And you'll be proud that you have done that. So this is the kind of direction that we are trying to bring in. And on the education part, yes, of course. And uh, whole education, and uh, one thing I try to point out in the education groups of discussions. I'm saying that we, uh, in our education system, we teach everything. We teach math, we teach physics, we teach history, everything in, in the best possible way. But we never teach our young people to, who we are. What is the purpose of my life? What am I supposed to do? Only thing it becomes meaningful, all the knowledge that from history and geography and physics and chemistry is meaningful when I discover myself, who I am, what am I supposed to do? So we should be debating and discussing in our class what, what, are our job, what, what is it that we do in this world? What are we supposed to do? Uh, then we will be having a very interesting discussion. And then at the end of the class, we'll be making a list what we would like to do in our lifetime. One, two, three, four, five. And every year you go back to this list that you did the previous year in the same class and revise it and hang it up in your wall. Just because you debated it, discussed it, and put it in your decision, these are the things that I want to accomplish in my lifetime. The fact that you have written it itself is a good achievement because somewhere in the lifetime you go, go back to it. Today, I don't have that kind of scenario of my life, what I want to do. That's what is failing. And then giving people option that whether I'm a job seeker or a job creator, discuss that. If I'm to be a job creator, what kind of path I follow? What do I do? If I'm a job seeker, what kind of job I'll be having for why? What is that I sacrifice by job creating? 
taking, accepting a job. Like I explained to young people in Bangladesh in, in a language that probably they understand. I said, why should you go for a job? Because if you take a job, you start at the bottom. Nobody will give you a top job when you first time you get. So you take orders from your immediate boss. And then there's a series of bosses on top of it. So all your life is trying to satisfy your boss. All your creative power you sacrifice. It. Why should you sacrifice your creative power? I said, if you're going the entrepreneurial path, you want to become entrepreneur, you always start at the top because you are the boss. You are the one who decides. You create. You bring all your creative resources into the picture, all your creative capacity in the picture. So today we sacrifice ourselves, that we don't bring our creative power because of the system of taking jobs. And then unemployment. We don't have any creative power used by the unemployed people. What a shame, what a sacrifice that human beings are suffering. With all this creative power it could be used, unleashed. Imagine what kind of world we'll have. But we don't create that. And it's, it's not an expense item. It's not an item that, oh, it costs a lot of money. It doesn't cost any money. It simply allows you to become more active, more, produce, more productive, and more creative. And all the problems that you see would not have existed if you make everybody creative the way this will allow us to do. So I see redesigning of education system is very important. It's not, I tell again, this is also relevant for education system. I tell that you don't have to wait to finally graduate, finally get your master's degree or whatever degree to get it, to become an entrepreneur. You can become an entrepreneur anytime you want. Any, any class you are in, if it was junior high school or senior high school, it doesn't matter because you're an entrepreneur. You don't wait for a certificate. You wait for a certificate when you will look for a job because you need this piece of paper to get in. This is your entry document to get in. But entrepreneur doesn't need it. That doesn't mean that you don't need education. You need education to the extent that you are interested in, not because of a certificate. So certificate orientation can go if you're an entrepreneur. And make sure what are the things interest you and get through that, those kind of education and so on. So I would rather have a redesign of the whole education system in that spirit. I wonder if I can pick up on one of your points about the uh, image on the wall and the list of things you wanted sure. to achieve. We don't have a lot of time left, but I'd be interested in your evaluation of your own legacy and what you also hope to achieve next. We've had a great vision of, of your ambitions. And obviously, we're talking in the context where the Bangladeshi government has been uh, aggressive towards the Grameen Bank, which is obviously one of your biggest legacies of your life. And I'd like you to just reflect on that and how you can what you feel about that really and what you can do about that right now? It's very unfortunate. It's, uh, uh, nobody likes it. Not in Bangladesh, not anywhere else, but somehow it happened. Uh, so it's a, sometimes it's a surprise. You don't know what happened. Uh, we are under a threat that the Grameen Bank will be taken over by the government. So, so they changed the law and everything. So we are waiting for that moment. And what about your, still your sense of your legacy and what you, you know, you still have huge ambitious plans for the rest of the world anyway. I don't see it's my plan and I'm seeing that it should be, uh, it could be everybody's plan. And what I'm saying, I don't think anybody said, no, no, I don't want that. I don't want a world where nobody, nobody is a poor person. I don't want to live like that. Nobody will say that. They will say, okay, this is a good thing. I want a world where nobody will be a poor person. And I want to feel good that in, a, in our society, everybody can take care of themselves, their own worth, not because somebody is giving them charity money or something like that, or state-dependent life. We don't need that. So that is something is not only mine, it could be everybody else. And I pointed out three zeros. All three zeros, I'm sure everybody would like. Zero poverty, zero unemployment, and zero uh, net emission. So that's it. And you can add on other zeros too. But this is something which we focus because that will shake up the whole world if you can achieve that. We will transform this society, human society. We can create the society that we want. We don't have to accept the society that we are in. So we have to have a map of what kind of society we want. That's the mapping process I was t talking about in our schools, in the, starting from the primary school. You start making imagination, I've said imagination is what drives people. So we don't have an imagination. We just follow the script. 
So that following a script is not a solution for anybody. Well, I'm going to interrupt. For, we have time for just one more question. I know that's very frustrating. There are lots of hands up in the room. <laughs> so I should be completely arbitrary. And there's a lady um, in a very nice jacket <laughs> um, <laughs> in the front. Thank you. So apologies for the man behind who wasn't wearing such a nice jacket. <laughs> Hello, my name's Hello. Fritha. I run a social business, and I've been reading your book. Thank you so much. Thank um, you. I want to give you a gift from the producers of my social business. There are 200 of them in South India. This is a secret pillow, and this is okay. for you. Um, I'm write, writing my business plan at the moment, and I own the social business currently. I just wondered what advice you give me to when I hand it over to the women in South India and put it in a trust for them. At what point should I do that? What would you do that? At what point should I hand over the business to the, to the producers of the secret pillow? When you're ready, you're ready. I mean, it's... Uh, if, if it's, it's something like, uh, give me an example, uh, let me give you an example. When you start a business with uh, an employed young person, we invest, so we become a partner. Uh, our and he, uh, his or her interest is how quickly he or she becomes successful enough to return the money that we gave him or her so that they become the full owner of the business and we stay out of their business. So it's a question of how quickly they can take over their business. So okay. That will be the good thing. And that will be on one success that we have done this one. And the next one, and the next one, they are on their, they are kind of launched into their trajectory. They are now have their own independent life and do that. All we have helped make that trajectory happen to them. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you very I'll much. Thank you. I'll write that in. Thanks thank you. Thanks for the secret pillow. Secret pillow. Yeah. Not so secret why, though. Why You're is it secret? It. <laughs> we can all see it. Ah, okay. That's a secret pillow. Wow. <laughs> That's a really secret. That's beautiful. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, Susan, do we have time for one more question, do you think? It's just 8.30. One more. One more. There's a little boy, which I'm being pointed at. Oh, that's good. So Very good. If you can just tell us how old you are and your name. Uh, Six. I'm Ben and I'm 11. Ah. 11? <laughs> oh. <laughs> he's, good at, he's good at many things, but obviously judging age is not ben. one of them. That's not the good one. If everyone is an entrepreneur in a village, who works for the people who create the businesses who are meant to create jobs? I, I missed it. What is okay. it? Do you want to repeat it? <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. I think the question, I think the brilliant question was, the best question of the night <laughs> is, if everyone is an entrepreneur in the village, who works for the entrepreneurs in the village? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Why do you need somebody to work for the entrepreneur? If it's just one person, how can you run a he successful He will be partner. Business? We'll work together. See? <laughs> <laughs> If, if, you, if you need me, you have to offer me something. So you offer me partnership, then I work with you together. What do you think about that? It's a good solution. <laughs> I think you should be getting into a debate with an 11-year-old. That's right. I, think, I, I think you need a right to reply. <laughs> well, if you're all partners, then technically you're creating a communist nation because everyone... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, it <laughs> it don't it be it don't be communist nation because we are doing it by our own consent. That's what we enjoy. I could work for you if you want, but I said no. Why can't we be partnered together? You look at the management part. I look at the production part, and that's it. So we share our profit and so on and so forth. Yes, but the human nature always <laughs> makes you selfish, <laughs> and it will always take the bigger half for yourself. Yeah. Sorry, which so means that. that you say, will say that one more time, sorry. Uh, well, this is the last, last, little, last um, question. The, the natural human Otherwise, nature will want the bigger half for yourself, and you're actually naturally meant to be selfish. That was, your, that was how the human brain was wired. Yeah. But the thing is, if you're a partnership, you're going to just get into fights. <laughs>
F I, first I, of all... <laughs> I will let Professor Yunus have the last word on this. <laughs> no, so. no. <laughs> Thank you. It's Thank a good you. question, very good question. Uh, first of all, I don't agree that human beings, by nature, are only selfish. That's what I was pointing out. By nature, we are selfish and selfless at the same time. So it's a mixture of selfishness and selflessness. It depends on how you grow up, which part will become stronger and which part will become weaker. The way you get through the education system, the way you grow up in your family, uh, what kind of aptitudes that you develop yourself. You can be 100% selfless person. You can be 100% selfish person. Depends on your environment, your thinking, your people that you work. But usually it will be a mixture between the two. One will be stronger, one will be weaker, or a 50-50. So if it's a 50-50 case, just to take an example, 50% of myself will be devoted in selfish activity, where I'll be the sole beneficiary of my actions in business life and so on. And other 50% is totally devoted to selfless activities, to solve problems, common problems, and so on, dedicated to things which is not bringing my selfish part into it. So I'll do both. And that's what I'm saying, saying we can do both. And as a result, let's try both of them, not just do one. Today, the problem of the economic theory right now, they misinterpreted human beings. They interpreted human beings as a selfish being. As a result, we created a world almost like a robotic fashion. We just keep on chasing money, nothing else. So that is something not true to human beings. As a result, we have created a distorted human society because of the way we are made to believe. So if you can made to believe, or you can examine that this, is, this looks more true to us than this one, then we can do that. It's all choice matter. It's not a, somebody is banging on my head that you have to do this. Not like that. It's a choice that I can do this, and you can enjoy it. And that's why I was mentioning making money is happiness. Making other people is super happiness. If you feel that way, then of course you'll move into the super happiness direction. You can reverse it. Making other people happy is a, uh, is a happiness. Making money is a super happiness. Yeah, you can re reverse it. It's a question of how you see it. That's up to you. That's why I said education system helps us to discover ourselves, who we are, what we want to do. That's why it's very important that growing up is a very important period, like you are going through. Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So, uh, before we came on the stage, uh, Professor Yunus said normally when he leaves the room, he likes to imagine that 10% of the people he's spoken to have been inspired by what he says. I have to say, I can well imagine that more than 10% of this room has been inspired <laughs> by what Professor Yunus has spoken about today. And I'd like you to join me in thanking him for uh, his words and wisdom and for coming here tonight. So, thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you. 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 Thank you very much. Wow.